Here we are. Here is today, Bold Maturity, Beethoven, Revolutionary Expansion. Two works, violin sonatas. I'm, I'm going to emphasize um, the first, the number seven and number nine for those people who know the violin sonatas, also Opus 30, number two, or Opus 47. We'll make a segue to uh, the first, uh, the middle string quartet, the seventh string quartet, and his cello sonata in A major, Opus 69. Just a smidge on that one. All right. Let us play, let me just show you a score. I won't play it very much. I just want you all to see the very beginning of the score of the Opus 30, number two, Beethoven's seventh violin sonata. And I just want to play the, show you the very beginning of each score, just to see the disposition. Four movements, Allegro in C minor, a slow movement, Adagio Cantabile in A flat major, a scherzo with a trio in C major, and then a finale. C minor for Beethoven is an important key. He does some of the most daring structural and harmonic moves as a composer, almost always in the key of C minor. All right, so let us play the, let me just So here is how this, let me just, I'd like you to take a look at how it opens. The piano starts with this bum, uh, yada da da dum, breathe bum, da 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 dum, and then in unison, da ba bi ba 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 bum, 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 and then the violin echoes. Even if you don't read music, you can kind of see that there's this one, two, three, four, one. There's a hold, speedy, drop, rest, 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 all right? I'd like you just to sort of visualize how that looks because I'm going to show you a fun part in one of his manuscripts, all right? Now, let me take you just to the beginning of the second movement. I'd just like you to see it visually. There's something to be said for just the visual. Even if one doesn't read music, you can see the density of notes. And let me move this here. All right, this is Adagio Cantabile. Lots of flats in a different key, slow, lyrical, piano starts out over here, and then the violin comes in over here with the same theme. Long, exquisite, with a middle section that's quite turbulent as well. That is unusual, that the slow movement has this move to something more turbulent. We're not going to spend a great deal of time, but what I'm trying to stress is that Beethoven is expanding the expectations of various movement types within the genre. It's as though he's mixing spices that don't belong together. Scherzo means joke. In C major, which is connected to the C minor, if you don't have the theory, don't worry too much. The whole point is that it's light, cheerful, and scherzo means joke. All right. And then the last movement is back in C minor. And there's this rumbling in the lower part of the piano. And this is a very peculiar thing because that first note is on the leading tone of C minor. He's making a big deal out of it. It's a theory issue. Just know that he's making a big deal out of this motive. Moreover, he's making a big deal out of the register. It's low in the piano, low in the piano. So what I'd like to do is play the beginning of each movement now with Two performers who are old friends of mine from the, the, the West Coast. My West Coast contingents, both Martin Beaver and Fabio Bedini, are on faculty at the Colburn School. They're recording the entire Beethoven violin sonata sequence. And just this past Thursday, they, re they released this one. So I think it would be nice to just play the beginning of each movement so that you can now put the idea of what you've seen on the score with two musicians playing together. Remember four, beginnings of four movements. Here's the first one. V 
beam in the violin now. Same tune that was in the violin, now in the lower part of the piano. Now turbulence again. I hate to stop it there, but it's a good place to stop. We're not even, we're about two thirds into the first big third chunk of the exposition. Long, pieces are getting longer. Movements are getting longer. The beginning of the second movement, one of the most beautiful lyrical themes ever written by Beethoven in my view, starts with the piano. what we're beginning to see is greater dialogue between the two instruments. One really isn't entirely the accompaniment. There's a gentle play that goes back and forth between the instruments. Let's play the beginning of the third movement. Light. Cheerful, I'm going to play it. It's going to take a repeat. Listen how a little motive is played back and forth in a light way, playfully. A motive, yum, ba dum, ba dum, moving in between the two instruments. And then he's going to play with some rhythm after the repeat uh, in a very funny, 
peculiar way. He's going to distort the rhythm. Then there's a huge repeat. Last movement, returning to C minor turbulent. You all saw the score. about this work, four movements in C minor, a key in which Beethoven tends to do unusual things. Here is an example, his famous C minor symphony that we, is, has, he hasn't written yet or released yet, Opus 67, and his third piano concerto, which is Opus 30. Let's see, the, <laughs> the symphony is Opus 67, and the piano concerto is Opus 37. So it's all along the way, but he, very plays a lot with C minor. Long and lyrical, there needs to be an L there, I apologize, a long and lyrical second movement. Turbulent, greater dialogue between the instruments. This entire opus, there are three separate works between in opus 30. There's a, you are listening to opus 30, number two, number seven, number six constitutes opus 30, number one, and number eight constitutes opus 30, number three. The entire set is dedicated to Emperor Alexander I in Russia. Interesting. Um, and uh, the last movements um, were conceived at the last time, which is one of the things I wanted to show you. Here is an example of Beethoven's sketchbook. It's an odd page. He's a messy guy. This is known as the Kessler sketchbook, and it's located in Vienna. And there are, um, there are uh, facsimiles available, but one cannot get to the library. I'm just lucky enough that I own a facsimile. And let me unshare my screen for a moment so I can see what I'm doing with my camera. This is a facsimile of a Beethoven sketchbook. I bought this in graduate school and lugged it around Europe. I was so sad in Amsterdam, people were making fun of me because I was lugging around, because this is only one volume. This is, but this is replicating Beethoven's book. And what I've done is copied the page for you that you see over there, all right? Welcome to Beethoven's sketch studies. We stare at these things, all right? And then we transcribe them. And there's another volume on my table here. And this is what we do. We Oops, that's upside down. Transcribe them. Look at that. And so let me just show you. And let me go back to my shared screen. I've shown you one page that yeah. you all can see. Somewhat, it's blurry, but somebody did a transcription. Here's the beginning. It says Sonata Second, Seconde, right? Da, be better, lump. Da, 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 dump. And then he actually changed it. Da, it originally had yada da da dum. Dum 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 da 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 dum da dum. So he changed <laughs> in the end. That was an original idea. But you can see that he was thinking of it in C minor. And the fun thing at the very end is if you see on the very same page, it says, oh, the, the end. I, let me just see. I'm showing. When I do this, do you all see the word slide nine? Does it block it? No. Okay, good. You see the beginning of the finale. 
And the point that I'm trying to make here is that Beethoven conceived of the whole thing for this particular sonata with the, with the end in mind. As his works are getting bigger, he's, he's thinking about how do I end this, not just how I start. People think that you compose and then you just spin out, ah, oh, once upon a time this happened and then this happened and then this happened. But this is like an outline for an expose paper or a legal argument. He knows where he's going. And so he sketches the big idea first. First movement's going to be in C minor, last movement's going to be in C minor, and deploying that lower regger, register, da 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 dum bum 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 yum bum bum da da yum, right? Lower register. And that is also a hallmark of Beethoven's middle writing. He is exploiting register. High, low virtuosity pieces are getting daring, expansive, and virtuosic. He knows he's, he's at the height of his compositional power. All right. Um, this is an excerpt from an article I wrote many years ago. And it's a nice table over to the right that I just wanted to share with you because we've talked about the sonata. Originally, Sonata, we talk about the violin sonata as just violin sonata, but in fact, until the work we're about to look at, it was usually the piano sonata with this other instrument. So here's a cello, so what we consider the cello sonatas, but it says two sonatas for le clavecin ou pianoforte avec, with a violin, with violin cello obligated, right? So in some ways, the cello is subordinate here. The violin sonata that we studied last week, not very long, but it is per il clav uh, clavicembalo o pianoforte con un violino, right? With a violin. And then here's a horn sonata, which we're not taking a look. This is the famous spring sonata with a violin. Here, the sonatas for pianoforte with an accompaniment of the violin. Hardly with. You begin to see that the violin is coming up in stature, dedicated to the emperor, Alexander. We're moving to this next work, Opus 47, and suddenly you have for pianoforte and a violin. It's and from this point forward, and what was just an obligated other instrument is taking prominence in the work. Even though all violinists and violists, and violists, violinists and cellists and violists like to claim the works, they'll call them the violin sonatas and the cello sonatas. It's really not until Opus 47 that Beethoven makes a conscious shift in nomenclature when the works get published. Okay? So, we are now at Opus 47, the so-called Kreutzer Sonata. There is a controversy. It was in the New York Times recently. I spent years studying this work. <laughs> years. All right. The controversy is the dedication. Beethoven first performed this work with a violinist named Bridge Tower, who had very interesting ethnic background, European, African background also, Polish possibly, but he, his official nationality was British. And what you see here, I've just taken you to a partial autograph. It is not complete. It stems from the time that Beethoven performed this work with George Bridge Tower. And it says, Sonata Monatica, Composto per il mulato bridge tower. Gran pazzo e compositore mulatica. He's playing with the word mulato because of his unusual background, of bridge tower's background. And bridge tower was an anomaly in British society. And they made him up in a kind of exotic way, put him on a turban and dressed him up and, and he garnered a great deal of attention. Lovely violinist, lovely violinist um, and traveled, famous. And we know that Beethoven and Bridge Tower played together on a certain day in Vienna. All right, according to one of Beethoven's biographers there, and according to common lore, Beethoven and Bridge Tower had a fight about a girl, and Bridge Tower, and he said, ah, I'm not gonna give it to Bridge Tower. Nope. I have yet to see where, aside from the Thayer account, 
I've been looking. I haven't seen anything more about a fight about a girl. It's just very, it's, it's, it's a nice story. People love to tell it, <laughs> All right? And my own work has actually been whether Beethoven had other ideas and influences from the other person, Rudolf Kreutzer, who did receive the dedication. The final dedication is to Rudolf Kreutzer, who was a prominent violinist in Paris at the Paris Conservatory. He had made his way to Vienna and then went home. There's this also the famous story is that Kreutzer really never played the piece, but we call it the Kreutzer Sonata. In my work, in a paper I gave ages ago in, in Canada, I made the assertion that there was a famous work by Kreutzer, a sonata that showed up in Vienna at a certain time during the composition of this particular piece that may have had a compositional influence on Beethoven's composition of this work that was eventually dedicated to Kreutzer. And in my view, it's not an either or, but a both and. Beethoven was planning to go to Paris at this time. We know that he was thinking about Paris. We also know, for instance, that the third symphony, the Eroica symphony, was going to be dedicated to Napoleon Bonaparte, right? And Beethoven, when he found out that Bonaparte made himself emperor, had a conniption, tore the page up, and we even have the evidence, a torn off page, he was going to dedicate it to Napoleon Bonaparte, but he was gonna call it Symphonia Bonaparte, in dedication to Bonaparte, and he didn't. I believe that this work, Violin Sonata, the, the um, symphony, and a very unusual concerto known as the Triple Concerto. It's a symphonic work with three soloists. That is not a Viennese thing, that's a French thing. So Beethoven was thinking, ah, I spent now about a decade in Vienna. I'm going to Paris next, right? That was his, just imagine, my next place is going to be Paris. And so when we think about the disappointment and tearing off of the, the page of Napoleon Bonaparte, we also think this is a huge disappointment for Beethoven because his plans to go to Paris were thwarted. But if you think about this work of this piano, this sonata for violin and piano being dedicated to Kreutzer, that would have paved his way also. A work that was featuring or dedicated to a very famous violinist um, with some techniques that resembled this other work by Kreutzer, all right? I could spend two hours just, well, six maybe hours just talking about this piece. I won't go any further, I promise. What I'd like us to do is take a look at the work together, just the beginnings of each one, each, each movement. Anybody see something unusual here? Anybody who reads music? What's going on here? The dynamics are strange over here, right? Forte to piano, forte to piano. But who's starting? The violin is starting. Violin starts and then the piano comes in. This is the first time that you have the other instrument taking the lead, okay? That's the whole point I wanted to make, which is the violin is starting. That's a big move in terms of violin and sonatas. Usually they start together or the piano starts, not the violin, and it's not easy to play. This is clustered quite difficult to play, all right? Major points, three movements, outer movements, huge and virtuosic. The last movement, by the way, of this particular work was originally destined for Sonata number no. six, Opus 30, number no. one, which again points to a kind of compositional habit for Beethoven. He has the last movement already written, so he writes the first two movements very quickly. He knows where he's going. Destination is important, which is one reason Beethoven's work sometimes feels so satisfying because he has the destination in mind when he's writing. When he writes the symphonies, he sometimes writes that way too. His third symphony, the Eroica symphony that I mentioned, last movement was conceived first. A series of, of variations appearing in different iterations, first as a ballet, and then as a theme and variations for piano, then ultimately the last movement of his third symphony. Again, the sense of finality, direction, he knows where he's going as a composer. The other points performed with George Bridgetower, dedicated ultimately to Rudolf Kreutzer in the published version. All right, 
here are the three movement titles. There's a slow introduction and then a presto and it launches into a very virtuosic um, passages for both the piano and the violin. Um, second movement is a theme and variations, very much like the theme and variations um, that you may have listened to if you listen to the complete first sonata for violin and piano. Virtuosic in the sense that the violin ultimately goes into very, very high register. Beethoven is exploring what the violin can do. And then the last movement, you'll notice, starts with a chord that is very much like the very beginning chord of the first movement. And in fact, we know that that chord from an autograph, we know that the, that chord wasn't there even ori written originally. He decided to put that A major big chord to make it link to the first movement. And what we're seeing in Beethoven as a composer also is how does he, he is trying to make an organic whole of many different parts, especially as the pieces get larger. How do you link them so that they make sense, coherence from the very beginning to the very end? All right, let us play a little bit of the beginning. This is uh, Anna Sophie Mutter the Lambert Orcus. Just play the very beginning of the first movement. Piano. <laughs> this piano is music is all chopped up on this stand. turbulent beginning. Start, now the piano's turn. Now it gets to show off. Now it runs. All right, that's just the second theme now of the exposition. We're not even a third way through the piece. I hope you can see that the violin is doing a lot of fast movement between the strings, a lot of string crossing and some double stops. All right, let's play just a little bit of the second movement. Andante con variazioni. Piano starts first. Mm -hmm. 
Gradually, each part gets more difficult, and the violin ends up playing way at the top of its register. All right, now let's play just the beginning of the third movement. Listen for the big chord that resembles the big chord at the beginning, played initially by the, the violin and then the piano um, of the first movement, linking the movements together. I don't think he was thinking of either Bridgestore or Kreutzer necessarily with this particular work, other than their compositional things, but not string, not um, violin technique necessarily for this, okay, pati so for this particular yeah. work. But it is, he did consult his first violinist, Schupansik for the string quartet. He, he consulted and he spoke with other violinists and certainly when he wrote his, his violin concerto, which is later. He played viola, he played strings. So he had some ability, he could play in the court orchestra. So he has an idea of strings, but what a, a string player can do, he's learning, I think. He's, I think he's studying the various um, treatises that are arriving in Vienna at the time. So last week we heard in the mid 90s, 1790s, right now we're looking, we're listening to 1801, 1803-ish. We're going to go all the way to 1808-ish, the first sort of decade after the 19th century. Thanks. Sure. So this particular, this last one, it depends on whether you count the composition of that last movement, right? Because the last one was written first, but it's probably 1802, 1803, but not published until 1805. That's a lot of time, right? If we're going to the publishers, like, I think you should go ahead and go with this name. He did write that last movement first, and then it took more time for him to write the other two movements. But it, but the, the performance with Bridge Tower was certainly the catalyst for him to write it and finish it, because we even have documentation of his copyist going, oh, I'm staying up till four in the morning copying for Beethoven. So he hired people, right, to, to, to play. People had to have parts for, even though if he wrote a whole score out, somebody had to have a part or had to read over the shoulder, if that's the case, too. All right, and when they were printed, they were printed in parts. They were not printed in score separately. So it was extracted from the score. They yeah. could buy it in the shops. And, in, and if you look in Vienna newspapers, you can, there's a famous news, uh, music newspaper called the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung, known as the AMZ. And there are um, reviews of concerts. There are stories of what's happening in, around the world. Also, guess what happened in Paris at the opera? This kind of thing happened. And also the fun thing at the end of these newspapers is there are advertisements, musical stores saying, hey, we have Beethoven's new parts for this. We have Haydn parts for this. And that's what I found, which is that there's a Kreutzer, oh my gosh, there's a Kreutzer Sonata showing up in a Vienna um, music shop. 
a work that was composed by Kreutzer in 1798, not showing up in Vienna until after the turn of the century. So publishing means money, right? It has to go through a certain kind of, of filter in order to, get, to have enough, um, the publisher is going to have to make enough money for the person to want to do it. For piano sonatas, certainly that's it's for home consumption. The piano is becoming greater, right? And 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 people are able to afford instruments more often, not just in the courts. The entire economy is changing in Vienna also, right? We don't call them duets. Um, we could call them duets, but they are because of the sonata genre and the expectation that it invokes. I think it has a, it has something to do with the the anticipation of the number of movements. All right, a sonata. It also has to do with its aspiration as a work. I think, but it could rightly rightfully be called a duet for two instruments. It's a fair, it's a good question. Since if we have two string players playing at the same time, we're more likely to call it a duet. A flute, flute, string, string, violin, violin. Piano, piano, four people, we might call them a duet. But there's something about the elevation of, of two different instruments. Sonata comes from the word sonare as a, as a long-term sounding genre. You know, we're, we're running a little low on time. So here's what I'm going to do also. I'm not going to spend much time on, on the cello sonata today. But what I would like you to think about is in the same way that the violin initiates the entire work for the violin sonata, the, the Opus 47, the cello in Opus 69 takes prominence. He starts. And that is Beethoven making a stamp. He had written two other cello sonatas before them. Opus five, um, and dedicated to the to the Prussian king. But this work is a much it's it's a more adventurous piece, and that Beethoven is working. And we'll spend a little more time next time. But I just want to go ahead and move to the string quartet and spend some time with the string quartet before we go, because in the same way that Beethoven gives attention to the lower register to start first with his Opus sixty nine cello sonata. You see in Opus 59, number one, which is the seventh of his 16 string quartets, a greater attention to the lower register. Again, expansion, register is important. In older string quartets, the violin, second violin just does one of these, chunk, 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 chunks, and viola too, chunk, 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 and then you have sort of outer movements, but the melody almost always is in the top. What you see is greater equality between all four parts of the string quartet. So as, let me go to Opus 59, one also dedicated to a Russian, Count Razumovsky, who was the ambassador to Vienna. Four movements, all the movements are getting longer. They're so long that Beethoven says, oh, forget the repeat of the exposition. He crosses it out prominence of the lower register, the cello, and this is a very Beethovenian middle period move to go directly from one movement to another without a break. All right, um, let me show you the beginning of each movement. I won't play them and then we'll play a little bit of the third movement going into the fourth movement. All right. I'm not even going to play that. That's the score. Look who gets to start, the cello. That's a big deal. Cello gets to start. And Beethoven doesn't need everybody to start in the same way. The first violin doesn't say anything until over here. Again, exploration of register, making the most of his sound world. He's played enough of the top. Let's see what we can do with the bottom. Second movement. Second movement. Look at this. Cello starts again, then second violin, then viola, then first violin. Mm. Yeah. 
And this is also, he's, this is not a typical scherzo. And scherzo usually happens in position three, but because the first movement is so gargantuan, what he does is move some things around and he lightens things up for the second movement. Third movement, long lyrical in the key of F minor. All right, very long. And then the fourth movement, here's the fun part of the fourth movement. We're about, this is the very end of the third movement. See how the violin is swimming around over here? And then there's a trill and there's no break. You know, usually you break and that's when people get to eat their cough drops or cough a little bit. There's no break. Okay, I'm gonna play the trills. Just, we'll just play the very beginning of it. Okay, trill and the cello again. Look at that, the violin is way up here. I thought we would play a little bit of the third movement moving directly. It's called Russian theme. And this is a cute little, this is a very, this is the end of the third movement, moving into the fourth movement of a lovely young string quartet a couple of years ago at New England Conservatory. All right, but you can see right here, first of all, look at where the cello over here, her hand is way up here. Pieces are getting harder and longer, but they're, they're testing the virtuosity of all the instruments involved. Let us play a little bit now. that poor violinist way up in the stratosphere. Second violin is playing the theme.
fourth movement there. fun, at least moving directly from one movement into the other. We see that in the Fifth Symphony, we see that in the Fifth Piano Concerto eventually. It's a Beethovenian stroke. How do I make sense of this entire work? I think I'll just cut out the break between the movements. And in fact, functionally something else is also happening. He's playing with the harmonic language to make one, essentially the slower movement, introduce that little segment into the finale. Your mini, your mini assignment is to listen to all four of those works for fun. But if you have to only pick three, first three, and then we'll talk a little bit about the cello next time.